Thanks to the CAQ for inviting me uh, today. It was nice to learn, too, that the discussion guide is strictly optional, so I'll just <laughs> put that on the table, and uh, let's get started. <laughs> anyway, it would be hard, looking at this panel, not to notice that uh, this panel has made great strides in an area where uh, other panels, and indeed the society at large, maybe hasn't made as great strides, and that's in gender diversity. Um, it's uh, as the... Um, as the sole non-diverse member of the panel, uh, I thought it'd be interesting to uh, kick off a discussion of diversity. It's certainly something that's, uh, that's, you read about it everywhere. Business groups are talking about it. Investors are talking about it. I read a post today on the Harvard Corporate Law blog about it. It is a very timely topic. Um, there are great strides still to be made. Uh, the recent statistics show that uh, the boardrooms of uh, Fortune 1000 uh, still are only filled, the seats are filled by women of 20%. So well, there's a, uh, there's work to be done. Michelle, what's your prognosis for how that's going to happen? What's going to move the needle to, to uh, increase diversity in the boardroom and in the C-suite? And what's going to make it happen? I feel like Johnny Carson, Karnak says. Right. <laughs> but the, um, first of all, I think about diversity perhaps a little broadly than, than people typically do. I think about diversity not only of women, but also of people of color and ethnicity. Um, we are not making as much progress there either. And I'm very concerned that, that ethnic diversity is going to get left behind if we focus solely on female diversity. As an African-American woman, that means something to me. You've put it in the context of 10 years, and 10 years is a long time. And I'll tell you why it's a long time. The average age in the boardroom today is in the mid-60s. 20% of our corporate directors, I just read this last week, 20% of our corporate directors are 68 years of age or older. So within 10 years, we are going to see significant turnover on the board anyway, without all, all this artificial stuff. But that does not mean that those open seats will be filled by women or minorities. It is, they can equally be filled by, I'm sorry, white men. There is no rule that says that they have to be filled with diverse people. And if you look at, for example, any filling of seats thus far, it hasn't been filled with diverse people. And so I think there's a, within a 10 year period, significant numbers of seats will be, get, be open, but it's going to take a, still a really keen focus on filling those seats with the most qualified individual. And I would hypothesize to you that in a large amount of those cases, those will be diverse candidates. And we as, as board members and we as investors have got to hold our feet to the fire to choose the best candidate and, that, and to allow ourselves to fill those seats with diverse people. You could end up with someone like me. Uh, keeping with our theme on, on transparency, uh, it's unlikely the U.S. would ever go in the direction of some other jurisdictions where there'd be quotas for, uh, for, for diverse uh, boards. On the other hand, even some mild suggestions about increased disclosure brought some, some concerns uh, raised in the marketplace. Peggy, you've uh, been in the forefront of, uh, of diversity disclosure, certainly Prudential uh, has been. What are the pros and cons on transparency and diversity, and will that help move the needle? Well, you know, I, I don't see any cons. I, I really don't. I mean, if you engage with, with, with your shareholders and boards represent shareholders and find out what they want and then disclose that, I see no con. Yep. I mean, I, 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 <clears throat> the con is if your numbers don't look good. And I use those as teaching moments, you know, to the board to say, this, you know, this is the goal, this is where we are. I mean, fortunately for Prudential, we had things like metrics, so we knew the skills and experiences. We, we would go out, um, of the nominating committee would go out, and when they dealt with the search firms, they would say, this is what we're looking for. This is what we need for oversight of, of, of this company. Um, and we want people with those skills and experience, but we want to see an array of diverse uh, potential board members. And what we do is we disclose that in our proxy statement, and it turns out that two-thirds of our board is diverse. Like Michelle, I don't look at it just on a, a, you know, a, a gender. 
you know, we, we consider all sorts of other things, um, and, and we do that disclosure. So, it, uh, you know, there's been an occasional, we ask for feedback from shareholders, and we do get feedback. That's the wonderful thing. We do get feedback. Some of it, um, you know, some of it is negative, some of it is positive. But I have to say, other than, you know, a one or two folks um, that did not like that, you know, I think it was overwhelmingly positive. Pretty easy data to get to. It's nothing like uh, the CEO pay ratio, right? No, no, very <laughs> easy. Okay. You know, one of the things, though, that I think is real important and, and sometimes gets lift, left out of this conversation is the way in which you get people that are qualified and have the skills and experiences is to make sure that they have the appropriate development and career track earlier in their career. And so we have to hold companies' feet to the, feet to the fire to make sure that those pipelines are built. And quite frankly, not every corporation, even today, has a robust enough pipeline going through where they're able to retain those individuals um, as they go up the senior management track that would, al would allow them to be really great board members. Yep. And Gene, diversity fits into the, the SASB sustainability criteria for human capital, the, the metrics that you use. Tell me how you're thinking about it. That, that's right. It is one of the aspects of human capital that, that we look at at SASB as um, possibly creating either a competitive advantage or disadvantage for companies or industries. And um, for us, it's, it's um, one of the things that uh, we look at, including um, not only workplace diversity, but um, education and training of the workforce, as well as uh, workplace safety. Um, where we see it um, having a material effect, so an effect on the financial condition or operating performance of companies, is where it will appear in our standards. And that, that really um, comes about uh, when it is not managed well. And when it is, um, it, it's a risk when it's not man managed well, it's an opportunity when, when it's managed well. But um, in terms of uh, where we see the risks arise, it's when industries uh, or companies have a significant disparity either between the diversity of their senior leadership or boards and the rest of the company, or where you see a significant disparity between um, the company and its customers in terms of uh, customer base, in terms of the diversity there, um, that um, gives rise to um, either to, to, to friction or um, to, um, a condition that is simply not sustainable going forward. Uh, and like I said, it can really be turned to its advantage uh, where it's managed well. Yeah. And, uh, Kathy, it was noted uh, today that you're one of two uh, women CEOs of uh, US uh, big four accounting firms. Um, I know we look forward to the day when that's not even a noteworthy thing to mention, that at the time <laughs> when that's just such a matter of fact that it wouldn't be even worthy of bringing up. On the other hand, what does it mean now as far as being a role model for people in your organization, indeed, throughout the profession? Yeah, Keith, I, it's a question I get a lot, and I see Lynn here, and, um, and so I'm sure she gets it a lot as well, is, as to why is this such a novelty? You know, I knew it was personally a big deal for me, but I didn't realize it was going to be a big deal for everybody else. So we do need to drive from novelty to the norm. It's really important what Michelle said, to have the pipeline. Um, and, you know, there's something that, um, you know, we're in competition in this profession for STEM, you know, and, and there's something in the Girls Who Code program where they say you can't be what you can't see. Well, while I agree with that a little bit, Lynn and I wouldn't be here today if we couldn't be what we couldn't see because we couldn't see uh, female leadership in this profession. So luckily we didn't necessarily say we can't be this. So, so I think it's important though to have the sponsorship, the mentorship that we all talk about. Um, I also, we talk about a culture of courage around confidence in our men and women, quite frankly, of all, um, you know, our young people don't necessarily want to identify in co cohort groups. Um, like maybe our generation did. And so I think it's just important to build these inclusive, diverse cultures to provide the opportunity. I think the Prime Minister of Canada had it right when he said, you know, he was being hailed for um, putting over 50% of his cabinet as a uh, female when he became the Prime Minister of Canada. But actually what he said, he said, I'm not a hero, it wasn't me. It was my party four or five years ago 
actually was working on getting women into elected office so that when he became prime minister, he said, I had a qualified pool of people. Exactly. Half of them happened to be women. So we need to think about it that way. And I know a lot of the, the firms in this room are trying to drive that leadership that way. Um, moving from diversity on to governance more generally, uh, Michelle, as you look at the corporate governance landscape today, is there any particular area that you think really stands out as a place where we need to make more progress and how can we move forward in that area? Well, I, first of all, I think a lot of the work that we've been doing at the Center for Audit Quality, we still have strides to make um, in those areas. But one that, that um, I think we are just at the very beginnings of, and I mentioned it in my opening remarks, is in sustainability. I really do believe that there are companies out there that are sort of flying below the radar that are putting out sustainability reports that are doing, you know, quite frankly, very nice jobs at disclosing what they do disclose. However, there's not a general forum um, by which people know that. And I look to the work that we did, again, on, re referring back to the audit committee um, disclosure project that we had, Knowing what other companies do gives people courage and it allows them to say other companies have taken that step and maybe I can take a baby step with that. And they take that material to their board and to their general counsels and they begin to um, build a foundation and a framework by which their company can then move a little bit further and be a little more open about their disclosures. I think that in sustainability, that's probably an area that is, I believe, of greater need. I'm not quite so sure what the future holds for sustainability reporting in today's world, um, but I say, you know, be not afraid, companies. Go out there and, and begin the process and, and begin the disclosure and understand what other companies are doing. There are a lot of companies out there doing good work. I think it will be demand driven. I think investors mm -hmm. will demand it. And the real question is organizations like Jeans being able to provide the information in a, in a common language that yes. allows investors to, to gather that together and make it usable for their investment decisions. And as Gene and I were talking about, it's also the forward looking aspect of that. Absolutely. of that information is, is not just what do your numbers look like because that's the past is not necessarily prologue. What does it mean for the future? So, yeah. um, if I could just, just yeah, jump ahead. in on that. Yeah. I think it is uh, a true, and, and I, I was really tempted to, to take my seven minutes and, and just rebut Ed's remarks about um, companies <laughs> not doing sustainability reporting, but I loved my topic so much that I didn't do that. <laughs> so, so you, you but, time but I have to jump in now, which is that, uh, you know, almost every Fortune 500 company does a sustainability report, and these are happening voluntarily. No one is making them do this. There's no regulation uh, to do this. Um, but what's happening from an investor perspective is that they're not comparable, they're not audited, they're not reliable, and there's a fair amount of marketing that's going on in those reports. And there's a place for marketing. Definitely, um, but when you're making an investment decision, you want a true and fair representation. You want to be able to compare performance. So mm -hmm. I think the leaders, the true leaders, not just leaders in sustainability, but leaders who will translate that into disclosure, right. will make the leap from the voluntary sustainability reports that are out there now and put that material information into the 10K. And, and what we see now in the 10K is acknowledgement of these, of these issues either in risk factors or MDNA, but um, the majority of it with boilerplate. So that's not helping investors. And, and, and subjecting that information to disclosure controls and procedures obviously is an important way of it's making sure that it's, um, yeah. that it's information that has been through the kind of rigor that, um, right. that, that makes investors able to rely on it. And Peggy, corporate governance area, you've uh, been a leader in the area from your days at Pfizer and now at, at, uh, at Prudential. And, you're on the board of directors of Occidental Petrol Petroleum now as a director and head of their governance um, committee. Actually, comp. I don't. I they changed me from governance to comp. I'm oh. still trying to figure out was that a demotion or a promotion. <laughs> <laughs> but in any event, what what lessons have you taken from your days of giving advice now to being on the receiving end of advice about governance as a director? You, well, you know, I, I think. Giving advice, I, I certainly know, knew what the role of a director is vis-a-vis -vis management, which is, I think is very important. 
And um, so I think th that's important, your oversight. Who do you represent? You know, the policies, the questions, you know, holding people accountable. Um, I'm also very easy to the staff because been there, done that, you know, so I don't necessarily call if my car's not there, it's two minutes late, so that's also. Um, but I also know uh, what's possible, you know, which is interesting because when you're, you weren't, you, when you're in a staff position, for example, things like disclosure, you know, you have to do a lot of your own homework and research, and I hang out with so many people like you. With audit committees, you know what, what, what really best practices are. And to me, that's where you want to be, is best practices. You know, for example, you know, at Prudential, we do have integrated reporting to a certain extent. And we, we put, because we've talked to our shareholders, and many of them are concerned, we actually put that information in the proxy statement. So we try to answer the questions that investors want. Um, so I think that's probably what makes it a little more valuable is, is that I've had the opportunity to see great and, and, um, and, and, and know really you know, what standards are on the boards that I might sit on and, and really what the possibility is, is perhaps to, to do things a little differently or to do more. Um, Kathy, I understand. Um, last couple of weeks ago, you were in Davos, mm -hmm. for, where the theme of the conference was responsive and responsible leadership. Um, what were the themes that uh, emerged in the course of the of the conference, and and how, how do you relate to, to those in your uh, role as CEO of Deloitte? Um, good question. Now, Davos sounds like the elites, but um, as one of uh, the CEOs I heard speak, whose wife came with them this year, and she said. All I ever heard was about helicopters and suites, and she said we had no helicopter and we had a bed the size of this table. So um, I can attest to that. So uh, and it's four degrees and there's no plowing of the street. So at your own risk. Um, anyway, it was as usual fascinating, responsive and responsible leadership. I call it the year of speed. We're seeing speed in policy. We're seeing speed in M and A. We're seeing speed in technology advances. Um, and I think one of the other key things is as you step back, I mean, there are companies doing some amazing things in the social um, area. Um, there was a company and manufacturer talking about lifting a million women out of poverty in China. And we just don't hear these stories necessarily um, through some of the great work some of these companies are doing. Uh, and so a lot of uh, social, I will tell you though, any session over there that had the word digital on it was sold out. It was amazing. You just put digital in front of anything, you sell it out. Uh, I did a panel on smart cities. So again, you put smart in front of anything and the possibilities are endless. And those sessions get sold out pretty quickly. Uh, but you, some amazing things going on with connectivity and quantum computing around connected cities. So I always say, if you don't live in a connected city, home, nation, car, uh, now you will soon. And um, it's coming and it's coming quickly. And, I was on the panel with the CEO of AT&T, Randall Stevenson, and he said, I, I think we're in our infancy, and I said, we're getting a teenager very quickly. Uh, and so a lot of uh, capital allocation being put into the Internet of Things, and that's where cyber comes in and security and things like that. So, so. all we need is a cyber terrorist combing through our smart refrigerator. Yes, our, yeah. uh, our nest, our nest <laughs> camera. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Gene, leading an organization like SASB, starting it from your garage, I understand, or the, the, <laughs> the metaphorical equivalent Facebook. of a garage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, how has your leadership style evolved over time? And particularly now, uh, SASB has a very high profile uh, board of directors. Uh, right. how, how, have, how, how have that changed over time? Well, I think uh, early on, uh, it wasn't that hard because I was just leading me, so it was <laughs> there, there were, wasn't a lot of discussion. Um, but um, seriously, in, in the early days, um, I think the leadership qualities of, uh, of courage and conviction were really important to uh, uh, be able to take that first step and, and reach out to industry leaders and get their advice on, on what we were doing and, and, and to, to be able to call up people like Cindy or, uh, or like Elise, who was the first SEC sitting chair to take a meeting with SASB. And, uh, and Bob Hertz, who um, I, I called up and said, Bob, what, what's this 
conceptual framework thing. <laughs> we, <laughs> I think we need one. <laughs> um, but to really, you know, and for every door that opened, there were 10 that remained closed. And, and you have to, as a leader, especially starting a company, um, really have conviction in uh, the need for change and your ability to contribute to that. Um, I think it's really transitioned over time. Now we have 30 staff. We have, a, as you mentioned, um, incredible uh, high profile board that's helping us achieve our mission. Um, as you begin to you know, run what is a little company now and, um, and do outreach, now I have to not do everything myself as I did in the early days and have a lot of trust, hire great people and trust that they're gonna do their jobs the board is going to do its job, and I have to um, believe in them and, and, and then focus on my job. So it's, it's been a bit of a, a shift, as you can imagine, as a, as a founder, you're, you're very, very hands-on, and then to uh, you know, trust that other people are going to get things done, but we have a great team. So. Collaboration and evolution. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, um, I understand you're on the board of the Smithsonian, and are there ideas from the nonprofit world that can be usefully imported into the profit um, uh, board of directors? Oh, I, I, definitely, I definitely think so, and I also think it's vice versa. Yeah. The nonprofit world learns tremendously more about governance um, from the for-profit world. Part of the, first of all, I joined the Smithsonian. I am so excited about this, I can't stand it. <laughs> the Smithsonian is the world's largest museum, set of museum institutions. There are 19 major museums, not just the seven that people visit on the mall. There are nine research facilities around the world. There are over 200 Smithsonian affiliates. And so the governance structure, this is very complex and very, sustaining because it is a national treasure. And we get 60% of our funding from the government, 40% we you know, either make or buy ourselves. Um, but the, the governance structure of really understanding strategically where we are going, what we are investing in, where our future lay, where the talent will come. It, now, instead of talking about accounting professionals, I'm talking about where will museum curators come from because that's not exactly a field you see kids going into. So where are those kids coming from? As everybody bashes people going into fine arts. Well, the Smithsonian needs people <laughs> who are going into fine arts. So part of the, um, the real opportunity is to step back and it's like being a baby. I'm drinking from a fire hose, understanding what the complexity is. But at the bottom line, from my perspective, is this institution has to be here 100 years from today. And so what can I do in my own little way to figure out how I can help move it forward? We just came back from a trip visiting the largest tropical research laboratory in the world, which is a Smithsonian lab in Panama. And they are doing incredible things there, one of which is, and I'll give you just a little snippet to show you how different my life is when I go to the Smithsonian. We went to a, for, a tropical rainforest. We saw a three-toed sloth. And why that was important is that the scientists there have found out by taking clippings from a three-toed sloth's hair don't ask me why they would even think to do that, but they did. They've done a bunch of research on it, and they think they have found a, a gene or something like that that they think might be an indicator that can be used in helping to, to cure breast cancer. And so it's primary research, tons and tons of other things that has to get done, but it's amazing. And so the governance that I try to bring to that is to try to make sure that we protect that because a lot of people would say, why the heck is the Smithsonian doing primary research? So there you go. Interesting. Um, let's, we got six minutes uh, left before we, these folks can, can uh, finally get out and start to mingle. So we need to be mindful of our time and I'll try to move us along quickly. Um, on innovation, Peggy, quickly, any innovations that you see in the future in disclosure and governance? What, what, would, you, what would you crystal ball for what might be innovative? What are you expecting to see over well, the next? Uh, you know, it, just borrowing from what everyone said, I'm, I'm expecting to see a lot more digital. Yeah. I mean, the videos, and as I say, my kids are not gonna spend the time. So 
they're going to want something where you get to explain it or more digital, just, you know, more I want to touch and feel. And so I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. Um, and it, it's also, I think, too, it, it's, there's going to be a lot more engagement. And, and, and so I think that is also going to be, you know, you're going to see more of that. You know, for, for those of you that don't like it and to have board meeting directly with investors, I, I think there's a lot more of that in your future. And Kathy, in the audit profession, with the innovation that you talked about in your, mm -hmm. in your speech, in artificial intelligence and structured data, how do you see that advancing? And, and what are the risks to the, to the audit of, you know, you, I've never seen an IT implementation that didn't go off the rails, right? How do you make sure that you can still stick with the quality that the profession obviously it is is cause number one right uh, so i think we're innovation. all wrestling with these investments in innovation and what the shiny new technology is how to take our own ingenuity and combine it with that shiny new technology um, i don't see a lot of risk because we wouldn't invest in the innovation unless it was going to enhance quality and it's yep. enhancing and actually giving more insight and more be able to use more data and quite frankly our young people are fired up about using these tools and technologies, whether it's new drone technology, whether it's extraction technologies, uh, analytics, whatever it is, because they're going to the client now with insights the client doesn't even have. So I think this is a huge pickup. So as we think about innovation, it isn't, it's always easy to say, let's go invest in AI. But we need to invest in talent too, and we need to digitize and tech savvy all of our talent so they all can, so that we don't necessarily, so we're building the auditor of the future uh, from the ground up. Um, you know, we can't only rely on the university systems to produce right. that, although I think they're doing a good job of bringing analytics into the business schools, out of the engineering schools, and everywhere I go, I talk about that. But I still think we need to, you know, help train them and help digitize them for this new world. And that's an investment, and we need to think about that as our R&D, um, in addition to the tools and technology. Um, Michelle, we heard um, today about cybersecurity, a lot of talk on the other panels about cybersecurity and whether it should be in the audit committee. And last year there was legislation introduced that would require corporate boards to have a cybersecurity expert on the board director. Do you have any thoughts on, on that concept? Where's yeah, I do. Yeah. I, don't think, I don't think they should require boards to have cybersecurity experts on. I mean, you, you could, you start, I think that's a slippery slope because there are lots of things that come into the boardroom and are we going to be putting experts on in every one of those FCPA, areas. So yeah. then the question becomes in my mind is not that, but the question is really how does the board get the expertise right. it yeah. needs? And there are any number of ways that it can do it. In some cases you may want to bring somebody in, but I will tell you the expert today in three years is not going to be the expert because it's, it changes so rapidly. Um, and so the question is, do you have access to experts when you need them and how you need them? And do you have somebody that is helping you to understand what questions you need to ask and the validity of the information that you are getting out of your own management team? The other piece of it is almost every board that I sit on and a lot that I know of include a lot of management, senior management, in the boardroom during the board meeting. So the CFO's there, a lot of the management team is there. It traditionally has not been that the CIO or the CISO has been in the room. In today's world, those people need to be in the room as well with management, and that will help because you will have those experts sitting there that can help interpret it from time to time. I don't think the audit committee has responsibility, but I do think the audit committee as it does for all other areas of risk, is responsible for assuring that there is a process and that somebody is looking out for those um, areas of cybersecurity risk somewhere either at the full board or at either a risk committee or some other place. It's not the audit committee's responsibility to have sole responsibility for that. Okay, we're down to one minute. Peggy, let me ask you quickly. We heard a little bit earlier about in investor information, how much information investors want, their insatiable appetite for this information, and just gimme, 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 they'll, they'll take every, anything. How do, you, how, how do we balance that? Because obviously I don't think we can have a thousand page 10Ks. How do you balance that? <laughs> oh, it's probably the same way I, I do reviews. You know, I, I, I really look for the consensus. 
And um, as I say, you know, look, I'm a good lawyer. I can obfuscate anything by giving you 852 pages and putting it on footnote 12. So the answer is, 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 is I think that's part of transparency. It, it's part of integrity. It's part of relevancy. You have to figure out what, what are the most important factors. Um, and and if, if, if needed, um, then have a, a way that people can drill down because you, 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 you can't overwhelm folks. And it's, 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 it's regulatory creep, it's all sorts of other things. But you know, there, there's, you know, there's the analysts on one hand and there's, there's a lot of other investors. So, but I'd like to turn it around. There's like, you know, like five seconds. From a regulatory point of view, what, what do you think about, uh, how do you deal with Fortunately, that? Fortunately, I'm not a regulator any well, longer. Well, you were, so <laughs> you don't have to give well, the disclosure well, anymore. Uh, yeah, I, I, um, I, we, it was very interesting. We, we met with investors who expressed the attitude about the insatiable demand. Indeed, I met one with a fund complex and their analysts and portfolio managers who said, you know, we like the more obscure the better because we have people that will go through that information and they'll find it. And that's our competitive advantage. And it, one of the things we, that was teased out in the concept release was, is it better to have more information gotten to these professional investors, the ones who are really setting the price on the market? Because, you know, you can say what you want about reasonable investors reading the disclosure documents and the like, but I think that by and large investors, and particularly mom and pop type investors, are relying on different things than, than the disclosure uh, documents. And getting the information priced correctly by the people who are the be in the best position to analyze and do that, I, I think is very important to the markets. That's my view. Anyway, I think we've come to the end of our time. In fact, we're uh, over it. And uh, I don't know what the uh, parting words are, but thank you for your time. We've enjoyed it very much. Thank you.